The Causes of the Great Depression. What was the Great Depression? The Great Depression was a global economic upheaval from 1929 to 1940. It was manifest by a sharp decline in business activity, high unemployment, and deflation. The peak of unemployment was 28% in 1933. GDP fell 15%, and international trade declined 50%. Industrial production fell 46% from 1929 to 1932. Wholesale prices decreased 32% between 1929 and 1932. Individual fortunes were wiped out. For example, the founder of GM lost everything in the market crash. However, these are numbers. They cannot accurately represent the hardship of the time when compared to our standards of living today. A sequence of events marked the Great Depression. One, the stock market crash and sell-off of financial assets, for example, Black Tuesday. Two, the decline in commodity prices and general deflation. Three, drop in demand for credit. Four, a sharp decline in business activity. Five, rise in unemployment. Note, the stock market crash from its dizzying highs in 1929 did not cause the Great Depression. The stock market is a leading indicator, a symptom, but not the root cause. We have to turn to economic theory to understand the primary reason for the Great Depression. The two leading models which explain the causes of the Great Depression are, one, consumption model, Keynesian School of Economics, two, monetary model, Austrian School of Economics. There are also many heterodoxic models that explain the crisis from shocks from the primary sector, such as drought and the Dust Bowl. In another theory, increasingly restrictive labor policies, such as Herbert Hoover's pro-labor policies, are propping up wages, with the rationale that low wages, spending would decline. However, this restricted the labor markets to adjust to equilibrium, or the Smoot-Hartley Tariff of 1930, which stifled international trade. On the other hand, the Marxist view was the capitalist system was inherently unstable. However, the theories we will look at are the consumption model and a monetary model as they have the most plausibility at this time. Each model has explanatory value. Since economics is a social science rather than a hard science, models are estimated at most to be probable with degrees of certainty. That is, models should be viewed not as entirely correct or incorrect, but rather, which model has the most explanatory value? Further, with different business cycles or parts of business cycles, the context is different. Therefore, the contributing causes of the lengthening of the business cycle might be different depending on what stage of the cycle the economy is in. However, I still believe there is one fundamental cause, and we will look at what it is. Also, each school of thought has a prescription to moderate or cure the economic decline based on lessons learned from the Great Depression, which is based on the theory of their causes. What do the models look like? The Keynesian explanation for the Great Depression. The Keynesian and neoclassical models are consumption-based models. Using aggregate demand and aggregate supply analysis, the model examines why the economy departed from long-run equilibrium and settled at an equilibrium below the natural rate of employment. The basis of this short-run settling at a point below the optimal is a fall in aggregate demand initiated by underconsumption. This decline in consumption, in turn, resulted in a reduction in autonomous investment spending. That is, in this case, the Great Depression, there was a loss of consumer confidence, confidence in the economy, and it led to underconsumption. The emotional component of spending versus savings was what Keynes called animal spirit which was primarily another term for consumer confidence. When consumers were not spending, business profitability and retained earnings declined, and this led to a reduction in investment spending, which leads to an unemployment and drives consumer demand lower and leads to persistent unemployment below the natural rate. Therefore, in everyday language, consumers and investors were in the sidelines. This dampened business activity and perpetuated the cycle. Consumers and investors, instead of being engaged in the market, held money because this was perceived as their optimal choice given market conditions. That is, there was a liquidity preference. Holding cash became profitable as prices dropped. Cash, in a time of deflation, 
is a riskless investment with a return. This liquidity preference further decreased aggregate demand, and it became a liquidity trap. A liquidity trap being when people prefer to hold cash over bonds, when interest rates have fallen too low to make the investment worth their while. Spending, or lack of spending, had a multiplier effect throughout the economy. When demand fell, firms had to cut cost, labor being a variable cost they had to choose, to cut wages or lay people off. John Maynard Keynes believed wages are sticky, that is, people generally do not accept wage cuts. Therefore, unemployment increased. When people were out of work, this further perpetuated a decline in demand as they were not spending or consuming. Thus, GDP fell. In textbook terms, if Y equals C plus I plus G, and C and I are stuck in low gear, then Y, or GDP, is by definition down. One of the reasons that Keynesian economics had so much influence was, within the context of the time, Keynes, his theory, made logical sense. If you were living in the 1930s, this is what you would have observed, a sharp decline in consumer confidence, exacerbated by bank failures, people hoarding money and businesses spending less and less. Next, unemployment, a lagging economic indicator, increased. Further, it seemed like it would not turn around through market forces, at least not in the short or intermediate term. If nothing else, Keynes's theory was an excellent descriptive analysis of the observed world with some causal links. However, his approach was useful in explaining the aspect of the how but critics questioned Keynes's explanation of the why. Further, his logic was not subject to empirical validation. That is, from the vantage point of the Great Depression, his theory made logical sense, but his ideas were untested. For example, is the money multiplier a valid idea empirically? What does the data tell us about the multiplier, or is it just an idea? Regardless, Keynes was observing the world around him and offered a theory and a prescription for help, and therefore, the emotional appeal was strong. This was a paradigm shift from the classical view that markets adjusted relatively quickly. Changes away from natural unemployment would with time be self-correcting in the long run. Keynes pointed out that this may happen, but in the long run, we're all dead. A monetary explanation for the Great Depression. The Keynesian theory of causes the Great Depression is more understandable to the layman than the monetary or Austrian theory for the explanation of the origins of the Great Depression. The Keynesian argument is essentially people were not spending enough money. In contrast, the monetary explanation is more abstract and therefore harder to understand for non-economists. This might explain why it does not have the widespread appeal the Keynesian theory does. There are different versions of a monetary explanation for the business cycle depending on the economist. We will focus on the Austrian School of Economics, specifically the expansion of credit in the 1920s which led to malinvestment which triggered the Great Depression. As far as a model for understanding the causes of the Great Depression, it has more explanatory value because it explains the impetus that caused the great initial shock as well as the prolonged depression more robustly. That is, it included the essential commodity of money at the center, a monetary cause a monetary explanation of a business cycle centers on the idea that disequilibrium in the market for money causes shocks to the real sector. To understand this statement, we need to build a theory based on some key components. Again, when the market for money is in disequilibrium, this will eventually create disequilibrium in the real sector. And the question is why? Why is this market for money so important? What is it about this market for money that has an effect all throughout the economy. How can this explanation for the Great Depression be a better explanation than the theories of Keynes or other theories? To understand this statement, that disequilibrium in the money market causes shocks to the real sector, we have to understand and build on some key concepts. One, money. Two, credit. Three, banks. Four, the central bank. 5. Interest rates. 6. The market rate of interest. 7. The natural rate of interest. 8. Disequilibrium. Money. Why money is the central component to the cause of the Great Depression and business cycles. The theory behind a theory 
is an understanding of what money is, how it has evolved, and what its function in society is. This is an important point. One needs to understand the why, not just the how of money. Money has evolved as a tool to efficiently satisfy the double coincidence of wants in a modern economy, and therefore used as a medium of exchange. Philosophically, society has gained an enormous advantage using money as an instrument to solve the logistical issues associated with the double coincidence of wants in a barter economy. That is, why we all use money and credit to consume and do business in the modern world. Unless you live off the grid in a zero-waste tiny home or live in an age of stone knives and bearskin, you need money and credit. As a consequence, money is involved in every transaction, every economic exchange, except for barter. Therefore, money and its derivative, credit, have the advantage of allowing us to function in a modern economy. However, it has the issue that if the market for money is unstable, it will send shockwaves to every sector of the real economy. It is beyond the butterfly effect. It is systemic, as money is the lifeblood of the economy. The power of money compared to every other commodity. For example, if the market for potatoes is in disequilibrium because, let's say, government price subsidies for potato growers, then there would be a loss to society in terms of utility derived from potatoes. This loss in consumer surplus is generally isolated to the potato market. However, if the market for money and credit is in disequilibrium, it will have a cumulative effect throughout the economy as money is a unique commodity because it is in every market. Using this tool of money exposes society to potential risks because it is part of every transaction. This risk is especially true when there is an external non-market force that restricts the tool of money from adjusting quickly to equilibrium. That would be the central bank. Have no illusions. Money and credit are commodities, and the laws of supply and demand apply. Money seeks to find equilibrium, just like every other commodity, unless something other than the free market controls it. If money and credit are subject to the laws of supply and demand, then why would it not equilibrate? It begs the question of why it did not find this equilibrium in the 1930s. What caused money and credit to be in long-term disequilibrium? The ubiquitous nature of money and credit, coupled with long-term departures from equilibrium, was disastrous in the 1930s, the dot-com bubble in the Great Recession of 2008, and potentially the next economic crisis. The disequilibrium spread to the real economy. Prices became unstable, people lost their jobs, the real economy being the demand and supply for consumer and producer goods. Symptomatically, this was manifest in macroeconomic measures like inflation, GDP, and unemployment. Therefore, monetary disequilibrium did not self-correct and negatively impacted the economy as a whole because money is involved in every transaction. And further, something prevented the market mechanism in the commodity of money from adjusting. The question is, what went wrong? Credit. Are you talking about money or credit? Taking a step back, it should be noted the Austrian version of this monetary theory of business cycles, including the Great Depression, is connected to credit and purchasing power rather than a narrow definition of money. It is essential to understand that monetary theory is broader than a commodity for money, fiat money, paper money, M1 or M2. The monetary theory of the business cycle is a theory of loanable funds or purchasing power. The expansion and contraction of credit-based purchasing power is governed by the rate of interest and effectuated through the banking system and financial intermediary system. Credit is ultimately based on money, but is not money in itself or even the velocity of money. However, credit increases the buyer's or investor's ability to spend. It is an extension of the purchasing power of money. If you think about purchasing power in a modern economy, it is not coins in the piggy bank or dollars in your wallet that matters. What matters is the purchasing power based on your ability to obtain credit. That is true for the consumer demand, such as houses and cars when you go to the mall, as well as business and entrepreneurial demand to start and expand operations. Therefore, our monetary theory of the business cycle is focused more on credit, which is an extension of money rather than money itself. 
the direct mechanism that regulates the credit market and the supply and demand for loanable funds is the interest rate. The interest rate is, in essence, the price of credit. The interest rate is at the center of the theory of credit and purchasing power and the monetary explanation of the business cycle. Banks, the intermediaries. To say credit expended too quickly, which led to a bubble, is a nice metaphor that describes the Great Depression, but it does not give us any meaningful insight besides a nice metaphor. We have to look deeper into the story. That is, why and how does credit expand and contract in a less than optimal way to cause this disequilibrium? At the center of the story of monetary disequilibrium, as observed in the Great Depression, are banks. Not just the sheer number of banks that failed, and the fact that people lost their savings, but perhaps more important, the role banks play. Banks are the conduit for loans, both consumer and investment loans, and have the role of coordinating investors and savers through the interest rate mechanism. Banks were not explicitly responsible, rather, they are the middleman, the staging area for malinvestments. If the banks were not responsible for the Great Depression, who was? The central bank the non-free market solution for money. The central bank was established in 1913 and started operations in 1914. As a historical footnote, the Fed chairman was Roy Young from 1927 to 1930, during the Roaring Twenties. Fed chairman Eugene Mayer was in charge from 1930 to 1933. This period was known as the Great Contraction, and then monetary base decreased by 35%. The central bank's purpose was to influence and stabilize key economic indicators like inflation, deflation, and GDP. The existence of a fractional reserve banking facilitated economic expansion, but it created to this instability. The Federal Reserve wants to smooth out business cycles by controlling the monetary base. This was the purpose of creating the Federal Reserve. This is why, in the beginning of the 20th century, the Federal Reserve was created. The instruments with the Federal Reserve Bank orchestrated the monetary expansion and contraction varied, including the money supply and reserve ratios, which is often the focus of economic analysis of the 1920s and 1930s. However, in this analysis, we are focusing on the interest rate because it more clearly illuminates the issue from a theoretical standpoint and is based on a theoretical lineage from Knut Vixell to F.A. Hayek. Specifically, the central bank maintained a low discount rate during the 1920s, which created the expansion and malinvestment. They subsequently raised interest rates, and this exacerbated the cycle in place. Regardless of the specifics, or the tool one focuses on, the idea is inordinate amount of purchasing power was created in a fractional reserve system that brought the majority of markets in the real sector to a state of disequilibrium through malinvestments. It's this fractional reserve banking system that provided this leverage but also this risk. Malinvestments being investments spent on ventures and risks that typically would not be profitable and resulted in inefficient production and allocation of capital. So who was responsible for this economic disequilibrium caused by monetary shocks? To quote former Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke replying to two monetary theorists, Milton Friedman and Anna Swartz regarding the Great Depression, you're right, we did it, we're very sorry. But thanks to you, we won't do it again. It should be noted, Fed chairman said this right before the Great Recession of 2008. However, it would be intellectually reckless to stop there. We need to see how this scenario came about. In this case, we'll focus on the interest rate. Interest. Interest is the price of loanable funds or purchasing power. The mechanics of this process of monetary disequilibrium is explained regarding an interplay between what is known as the market rate of interest and the natural rate of interest. We'll define these two rates of interest below. First, conceptually, what is an interest rate? An interest rate is the price of money with time value factored in. And in a modern economy, more precisely, the price of loanable funds, interest is a price. It is the price of loanable funds or credit. Any price is a mechanism that brings markets to equilibrium. Conversely, if any price in any market is incorrect, then disequilibrium results. It is not much different 
than when I bring my potatoes to a farmer's market and try to sell them. If I charge $20 a pound, no one will buy my potatoes, and my product will not clear the market because the price is too high. However, if I charge one cent a pound, I'll sell out of my potatoes. However, I will not make an economic profit. Therefore, I will not have an incentive to grow next season any potatoes, let alone cover the cost of my production. In both cases, the price is incorrect, and it is a market failure. Free market prices optimize productive and allocative efficiency. If the market for money is not free, productive and allocative efficiency, something that the free market does the best, results in disequilibrium. We can conclude if the interest rate is a price, essentially the price for loanable funds, a derivative of money, and if the price is incorrect, then just like any mispriced item, the market will not result in productive and allocative efficiency for loanable funds. In other words, credit and purchasing power will be too much or too little and misallocated. This means if the interest rate is too low or too high, then disequilibrium will result in the market for money. The implication is this is a misalignment between supply and demand for loanable funds, between savers and investors. This incongruence has a real impact on investment and consumption. That is because money or a derivative of money is central to every transaction in a non-barter economy. That was the scenario that caused the Great Depression. The market for money was not in equilibrium, and this had an impact on the real sector. That is, the market for money was in disequilibrium because the interest rate was too high or too low. What does it mean the interest rate is too high or low? High or low is relative. Observable rates are relative or nominal unless it's compared to an expected norm. Interest rates you see at the bank, at the storefront, are either for savers or investors. For example, for savers, you might see bank CDs advertised, savings or checking account rates, home mortgage rates, car loan rates, on the other hand, for investors, you may see small business loans, business loans for the expansion of your business. This observable rate you see at the bank is what is known as the market rate of interest. You can actually go to the bank and take out a loan and they give you a rate of interest. What can this be compared to? How do we know if this interest rate is high or low? There's something called a real rate of interest. That's the interest rate minus inflation, but we're not going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about something called the natural rate of interest. The natural rate of interest compared to the market rate of interest. A business cycle such as the Great Depression is expressed as a disequilibrium between the two rates of interest, the observable market rate and the natural rate. This is not to be confused with the Fisher real rate of interest which is taking the nominal rate of interest and subtracting the inflation rate. The natural rate is the rate that would equilibrate the market for money or loanable funds. Let's examine what these two rates are, the market rate and the natural rate in further detail. What is the market rate? The market rate is reasonably easy to understand. It's the observable rate, the cost of loanable capital. The interest rate can be seen at financial intermediaries such as banks and indirectly controlled by the Federal Reserve. This is the market rate at the storefront of the bank. The market rate is the rate which the central bank indirectly sets through the use of their policy tools. It is the central bank's responsibility rather than the market in this case that determines the price of loanable funds. Retail and commercial banks respond to central bank action, that is monetary policy, and base their rates on what the central bank does. For what you see advertised, again, for mortgages, car loans, and business loans. The problem with this scenario is if the central bank miscalculates the proper interest level and what it should be, then the supply and demand for loanable funds, purchasing power credit, are not optimal. They're not in market equilibrium there would be an imbalance. There would be too much or too little demand for loanable funds relative what would exist in the free market and bring markets to equilibrium. Credit would expand too quickly or credit would not expand enough. 
This improper rate of interest will initiate a cumulative process of price changes in malinvestment. Again, in every other market, the price of a commodity finds equilibrium through information of the market mechanism. However, in contrast, in our economy, since the establishment of the central bank in 1913-1914, the price of money loanable funds is indirectly determined by the central bank through Federal Reserve monetary policies. That is, the market rate of interest is not determined by the supply and demand for money or loanable funds in a competitive market model such as in free banking. Instead, the market rate of interest is determined through the influence of the central bank's monetary policies. These monetary policies include such things as the reserve ratio, the percentage of cash banks need to keep in hand in reserve, open market operations, buying and selling of government securities, and the discount rate, the rate received by financial intermediaries for loans from the central bank. Without the collective intelligence of the market to set the price of equilibrating, either way, the central bank needs to estimate the interest rate and ultimately the level of money in the economy based on their best judgment. So it's not the free market that determines the rate of interest, the observable rate of interest, but a very top-down central bank that guesses or has an estimate of where the interest rate should be. Let's look at the natural rate. What is the natural rate? The natural rate of interest is a hypothetical rate. It is not an observable rate, rather it is a theoretical concept. The natural rate of interest is also called the neutral rate, the equilibrium rate, or r starred among econometricians. The natural rate of interest is defined as the rate of interest which represents the marginal return on capital in an economy of barter ratios were used. The Swedish economist Knut Vixell postulated this as the rate of interest to explain price movements and the Neo-Vixillians and the Austrians to explain business cycles and the Great Depression. In other words, it was approximately the rate of return on capital in a moneyless economy if barter ratios were used. This theoretical rate is the rate that would bring the supply and demand for loanable funds in equilibrium. One primary tactical objective of the central bank is to harmonize this theoretical natural rate of interest with the observable market rate. This harmonization is what the central banks believe will make money neutral and the real economy function based on the supply and demand of individual commodities rather than monetary distortions. This fits into the strategic objective of stabilized prices and the business cycle. If the market rate and the natural rate are in equilibrium, then in theory, money should be neutral and the economy, the supply and demand for every market would act in according to the free market. However, if there's a distortion, a divergence between the natural rate and the market rate, then disequilibrium results. And this goes back to the original point that money is the most important commodity and found in every single economic transaction. So what caused the Great Depression? The Great Depression was caused by the central bank, the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States, setting interest rates too low relative to the natural rate in the 1920s. After World War I, there was an economic crisis. Rates were relatively high. Subsequently, the central bank lowered the discount rate. They lowered the interest rates. And this put rates at a relatively low level. And this ushered in what is known as the Roaring Twenties, an economic boom fueled by low interest rates. The issue here is this prolonged time of low interest rates caused malinvestment, and that caused the Great Depression. This boom, this divergence between the natural rate and market rate of interest was the cause. This caused monetary disequilibrium manifest in an inordinate expansion of credit and purchasing power that resulted in malinvestment. The theory of money and interest as the primary cause of the Great Depression is founded on the underlying premise that money is ubiquitous and involved in every economic transaction in some form as a medium of exchange. Hence, interest rates, monetary economic shocks, 
caused disruptions in the capital formation. This monetary shock brought by an overexpansion of credit because of low interest rates created the boom of the Roaring Twenties. In explaining the depression, it is the boom that is the focus because embedded in every credit-fueled expansion is a latent bust. Generally, the timing of the economic cycles are hard to predict, but the effects are seen usually in a leading economic indicator such as the stock market. The stock market declines, then a decline in GDP, and lastly, a rise in unemployment. So you may see causes and explanations of the Great Depression that the stock market crash of 1929 caused the Great Depression. This is incorrect. What caused the Great Depression? The divergence between the natural rate of interest and the market rate caused monetary shocks and disequilibrium in the money market, which spread to the real sector. The recession of the 1930s turned into a Great Depression when the Federal Reserve subsequently followed a restrictive monetary policies that were not congruent with the conditions of the time. This theory was detailed further in Murray Rothbard's book, America's Great Depression. However, we're following a lineage of the Austrian School of Economics by F.A. Hayek that is more precise, a theory of interest rates. Does economic theory matter? Let's think about this. The Great Depression was not necessarily caused by the Federal Reserve misestimating the natural rate of interest and setting the discount rate below the hypothetical rate. Instead, the reason the monetary policy was incorrect for the time was the economic theory of the time did not articulate this conceptual framework, at least not to the level and depth that we've articulated. It had not penetrated the consciousness of the chairman of the Federal Reserve. In a word, the Fed was flying without a clear map, without an understanding of the relationship between the natural rate of interest and the market rate of interest. The Federal Reserve was looking more generally at the interest rate in relation to inflation and testing the Federal Reserve's newfound power to steer markets. It was the experience of the Great Depression that brought this early theory of the natural rate of interest to light. The natural rate of interest has been brought to the forefront of modern Federal Reserve econometric models. However, there is a set of new issues. The issues are the ability to estimate the natural rate or if there is one natural rate or multiple natural rates is another topic. Even empowered with this theory and the debate and the new understanding in academia, even with this theory and a new understanding in academia, such as Michael Wolford in 2003, his book on interest and prices, and a great deal of literature around the Great Depression with a monetary perspective, history seems to repeat itself. The lessons learned from the economic cycles of the past is not how we can better fine-tune the economy by micro-engineering macroeconomic monetary variables, but rather we should question if the central bank should be involved in this essential commodity of money and its derivative credit. Should they manage it at all, or should we leave it to the markets to decide its value? Therefore, the central bank inadvertently caused the Great Depression the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States of America initiated and deepened the Great Depression with monetary policy. The irony is the central bank's monopoly of money came about in an attempt to stabilize business cycles, the price level, and GDP. However, it cannot do this as efficiently as the market mechanism. In conclusion, it is not that capitalism failed during the Great Depression. It was that the United States of America departed from the idea of the free market in the most essential commodity, that is money. <laughs>